We're a new organisation. We've been going about a year and a half. We've got a little bit of money from the Scottish Government. Thank you, Robin. And a little bit of money from Esme Fairbairn. Thank you, Esme. Who keeps a lot of people going, doing good stuff. Nurse Scotland tries to join up the food agenda um, in Scotland. We're very focused on Scotland. We're very excited about the potential of the devolved administration of two three independent countries to do something different about food. Um, and we think that's a worthy piece of work to focus on. So we're basically, for the next couple of years, working on sort of three main areas. Very roughly, trying to develop a civil society coalition around the environmental issues of food. As Mike says, four hundred parts per million should be a wake-up call, but it's not. And if 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from food, we need to be joining up the environmental agenda with the food agenda. The food's been very low on the environmental agenda. I think that Smart Seas Initiative talked about energy and charcoal, we talk about food. And the wildlife organisations of whom we have a lot in Scotland, you know, very well organised, very well networked, haven't tended to very much connect the wildlife agenda with the food agenda, even though in the last 40 years, about half our world's wildlife has disappeared. And the major pressure on our world's wildlife is the food system. So we need to join up the environmental agenda with the food agenda. The second thing that we're working on increasingly, and I'll hopefully not bore you by following on some of Bill's points, is about the right to food and trying to change the discourse from food as charity to food as a right, because we think that actually holds the key to quite a lot of structural change we need to make the food system as fit for purpose. And the, the third area is the alternative food economy. Pick up on Mike's point here, some of that economy will be traded, some of it will be not traded, but to try to grow the alternative food economy in Scotland and try to scale up. And a lot of the work built up, a lot of the community food projects do fantastic work. Can some of that be scaled up? You know, in the early 70s, when Bill and I were both around, there was a housing cooperative movement that was trying to get houses for people by going and squatting in them and making a difference. When the Housing Association Act came in, I think it was called 1977, you know, you suddenly got a sect which went from being the pioneers to being people who then became part of making provision. And we think the community food sector has got the potential to do that by scaling up, but we won't get there if it's, if it's left to you know, brave pioneers just on their own without any sort of structural support for that. So those are three areas we're working on, and I think those overlap helpfully. And trying to get those conversations going between different people is really important. So very recently, somebody from the Poverty Truth Commission in Glasgow was a meeting, he said, I would really like to be in a place where I can talk about organic food you know, in the same room as we're talking about food poverty without being laughed at. Because actually, if you want to create a just world, as Mike said earlier on, if you've got to link social environmental justice, and if we carry on screwing up the planet and they were cheap food, then sooner or later somebody's going to pay for that. And it's not us, it's the other kids, and it's certainly the animals that bear the brunt of the exploitation that goes on. So we have to think about how we join this up globally. That's what we're trying to do in a small country on the northwestern edge of Europe. Okay, here we go, yeah. So basically, nourish. We're trying to work on these four areas. We're trying to change what we eat, change how we farm, change the local food economy, and change policy at all levels. And I'll probably say this again later on, but all levels definitely means global and EU. National government policy in Scotland might was critical. It's moved a long way from where it was. And I think it's still in motion, which is good. And I think things like the Food Commission will help there, but also at city level and at community and village level, because cities have a potential particularly, I think, to drive some of this change. They are the sort of, um, if you like, the economic engines, and we'll see more of city food policy in the future. Okay, I want to come back to, I, was, I, I wasn't sure what Bill was going to say or what the other speaker was going to say, so I probably made a little bit too much on food poverty um, rather than the sort of big global picture, but um, I do think it holds the key to some of the other changes. So I want to come back to the recent report on that's been called the Wellbeing Report, the all part of the parliamentary group chaired by Frank Field, who, for those of us with long memories, was sent away a few years ago to think the unthinkable about benefits. Our feeling about the report is they've come back thinking the very thinkable and the absurdly banal, actually. Right? So we are fundamentally critical of the quality of the report and the quality of thinking in the report. And we need to move in a very different direction, Scott. So it starts off very early on saying feedback's here to save the foreseeable future and actually accuses anybody who argues against that and strengths that. But we just have to accept that that's the way things are. Now, how many people 
in the campaign to get slavery just said, well, slavery is going to be here for the foreseeable future. We just have to accept that's the way things are. It's part of our economic structure. Um, so we, we do have to question that whole starting point. Incidentally, I just want to go off on one for a minute. We just talk about corn laws. Because arguably, you know, we are still seeing the echoes of the corn law debate in the UK, 100, two, nearly 200 years later. The argument was about whether you could keep wages down, fundamentally, could you keep wages down by keeping the price of bread down? And the industrialists won. Over in Europe, we had a very different debate going on, which is about not only protecting farming, but also following a period of Napoleonic land reform, which would have a completely different structure of land ownership in Europe. So a lot of differences between Europe and the UK and Europe and Scotland in particular go back a couple of hundred years to the way that we engage with the food issue. And arguably, the opening up of free trade in food has created a lot of commodity imbalances and quite a lot of the environmental damage that our globalised food system is imposing on the world. So before then, as Mike said, most people did eat stuff mostly from around where they lived, and some of it would have been more expensive. But if you're going to take other people's land, then it's much easier to produce cheap food than it is if you try and grow it in your home. So, so there's lots of layers to this, but the fundamental thing is food is historically cheap. It went up in the 2007-8 price spike. It's come down the headline figure since then, so in the last year or so it's gone down, partly because the price of always but we still keep going to food banks. So driving down the cost of food is not the answer. And the cost of cheap food to the environment is too hard, high a price to bear. So we have to find a different way of helping people eat well. Making food cheaper isn't going to do it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have food banks. So, and I think it was ironic that, you know, one of the expert ministers, they called, wasn't Liz Dowler, who submitted Evans inquiry, but Jack Monroe, you know, who sort of, whatever her merits, you know, that was quoted at length as a justification for this argument. It was very much saying, let's just take sort of snapshot view that food banks are here to stay. It's hard to see how you get rid of them. They come up with some reasonable things. You know, we should raise the minimum wage, absolutely. We should encourage local growing, and we should tackle the fuel premium. Yeah, fine. You can't argue with that as a general point. But their basic message was we should create a national organization called Feeding Britain, which would institutionalize food bank provision while saying we don't want to institutionalize food bank provision. And one of the key things Graham Riches argued about when he came over here was, we've had 30 years track record in Canada. Would somebody please listen to what we're saying? If you do nothing, you will institutionalize food banks. There's not a sort of, if we do nothing, it'll carry on the same. If we do nothing, they will become embedded into our social fabric and into what we still call our welfare state. Right? They will simply become part of that and we will have endless conferences, debates, training programs, networks of networks, people making their careers out of running food banks. That's what we will have. We will have diploma in food banks organization, you know, before long, probably somebody's set one up already online, you know. So that's what we'll get. We'll get a situation where you can't have a dinner party or a fundraising event, you know, or a going to climb a mountain without losing some money for the food banks. That's the way we go, if we do nothing. So we have to do something. There is stuff in there which could, was not out of place, you know, in Victorian times. But this fundamental idea that a solution to this problem is to get poor people to eat more supermarket food waste. It's just extraordinary. It's an extraordinary approach. It, it strikes out what we think about our society mm. and our fellow citizens. You know, why not just bundle it up and send it to poor people overseas? Mm. Because we've sort of stopped talking that way about poor people overseas. We stopped talking about food aid as being the solution. <coughs> to the inequities of development and the post-colonial regime. We stopped talking about that way. But we're quite happy to institutionalize food aid and to give food which is not suitable for ordinary people to poor people. Either it's suitable for everybody or it is not suitable for everybody. Right? There are not two classes of human being in Scotland and they, should, are not, they shouldn't have two classes of food. One that's fit for consumption, and one that's not fit for consumption. Okay? One that's surplus to requirements. So that whole fundamental idea that we solve two problems by mixing those things. We worked a lot in the, in the charity world before we worked in this field. And we used to find it very difficult to accept the idea that you would try to fund services for disabled people from things that people threw away. And we find it very difficult to accept that you would try and solve the problem through poverty. 
from food that the system is throwing away, where waste is built into the system at all levels, from farmers having to grow more crops than they need to meet the spec, from contracts being set so that there's always going to be spare capacity, somebody's going to get the crop rejected even if it's not good, to various stages of the supply chain where it gets wasted. And that's before you get to post-consumer waste. But a lot, most of the food waste actually happens further up the chain before we take it home. Although we've taken a lot of the sort of blame for food waste. Most comes further up the system. There's the old stuff in there too about people should stop smoking and then they'd have more money for food. Right? We need to teach people budgeting and cooking skills. There's a wonderful bit where it says we should introduce people to the concept of credit. Bill spends a lot of all time working in low income communities than I do, but my guess is that people in low income communities, like the rest of us, have got the basics of credit. They sort of understand that issue of credit. And, and what they probably don't need is to go to class to learn the concept. And they certainly don't need to go to class to learn supermarket psychology about how to resist the buy one, get one free offers. Right? So those are the things in the report. And as a non Christian, as a secular person, mm. I also find it very difficult that not only does it continue to refer to Christian traditions as if there is no secular tradition of good citizenship, but it also completely omits the other faiths in Britain. So that is bizarre to me. So just add a bit of a rant about that. Anyway, <laughs> so I did like the report. Um, so here's our view. Food poverty is one aspect of the grotesque inequality in Scotland and the austerity regime. And yes, it's happening in the past. Well, that doesn't mean it needs to keep happening here. Nutrition, like education, like housing, like health, is a public good. Right? It is too important to leave the market. Full stop. So we have to take it on as a state responsibility. And to do that, I think we need a mixed economy of food. I think Bill's absolutely right. We need an economy of food, which is also about community food projects, which is about these alternatives, which is about community-owned shops, which is about community gardening, which is about community-owned farms, which is about Communities taking control of the means of production and the means of distribution. That's a part of the solution. We need a mixed economy of food. <coughs> we already have a right to food under the UN Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that we signed, the UK government signed under Jim Callaghan. That's there somewhere, but it's not justiciable. We can't take anybody to court about the right to food. Nourish wants to see that embedded in the Scots law. And our understanding from the Scottish Human Rights Commission is that we have the power to do that. Right, we have the competence to embed that into Scots law. And we're about to start a campaign working with anybody who wants to join us. Bill's organisation, Poverty Alliance is here, Oxfam Scotland, anybody else to say, can we get this into law? And can we get on with that? It's not going to solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem of food banks overnight. What it does is it says, as a state, as a country, as a region, whatever we call ourselves in Scotland, we are saying this is a responsibility of government to ensure and progressively realise our citizens' right to food. And we want to change the discourse. So that's what it's about. And that actually supporting sort of community food initiative that Bill's worked so hard on over the years is part of progressive realization. It's not getting rid of those, it's not replacing those, it's building on them. The US Sustainable Development Goals, I say a little bit, I think provide a useful starting point for this conversation. I think for the first time the post 2015 Sustainable Development Goals start to talk about the world as one world not the world of poor countries and rich countries. You know, what we know what has become abundantly clear in the last decade or so is that this really isn't about poor countries and rich countries, it's about poor people and rich people. There are plenty of rich people in poor countries and many poor people in rich countries. And actually that food insecurity is not something countries experience, it's something individuals and families experience. And we have to get away from this idea that there are hungry countries and, and, and overeating countries, there are hungry people in every country. Um, and as I said, cities and local governments can play an important part in this, in supporting some of the grassroots work. Okay, next. Okay, just a little bit on subsidies and markets. We have to subsidize food, it seems to me. I don't think there's any way around this. We already do subsidize food, but we don't subsidize food in a very rational way. So we can't go down the road and make the food so cheap that we throw more of it away and that everybody can have some hope where they are, because that doesn't work. Right? It hasn't worked, and it, it's not working. Um, so we're really subsidised food. Our major subsidy for food, probably apart from the money we spend in the NHS picking up the cost of bad food, is the five hundred million pounds we spend on the crops policy in Scotland. And arguably, what that mainly does is inflate land values. It doesn't actually keep dairy farms from going bust, but potato farms are going bust at the moment. 
but it inflates land values and it tends to give more to those who already have. Um, it, we already have things like healthy start vouchers and free school meals, so we're already saying actually some people in the population need to get access to cheaper food. So what would it look like if we sort of generalize that, universalize that, build up a bit? Um, we know that most of the externalities in the food system are transferred either to the general public in the form of cleanups, the amount of money we have to spend taking insecticides or molluscicides out of the water before it's fit to drink, um, let alone the downs, you know, downstream impacts of the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen assessment, the European nitrogen assessment, is right here, reckon that roughly speaking, it costs the European Union 300, somewhere between 80 and 300 billion a year to clean up the impact of nitrogen, which doesn't contribute anything like that amount to the increased value of food. So, but what happens is that you don't, the polluter doesn't pay. So other people pick up the costs of those externalities. And when we look at things like climate change, and biodiversity and impact the food systems having on those, it's not us that are going to pay the most of that, it's going to be our kids that pay the most of that. <laughs> so we need to think about where that money is going, and whether we can redirect it. Um, that's a bigger thing in Scotland can do on its own. But we can do stuff, as Bill was saying, we can do stuff about the other bits of people's survival ability past their six weeks. We can do stuff about rent controls. Housing costs in the UK have gone up much more sharply than in France in the last decade. We can do stuff about communitising utilities. You know, yet again, we've got another thing for the big six about how they can't do anything about you know, reducing electricity prices, even though you know everybody knows the cost of what they're buying has gone right down. But sometimes they're incapable of doing that. It seems to me local authorities have people's names and addresses. I don't see why they can't provide their electricity. <coughs> they already charge them their rates. They can make it electricity be a lot easier. And then you could change the tariffs, so you pay a lot less for the first few units of electricity, a lot more as you consume more. Whereas at the moment it's the other way around. You pay more for the first few units. So not hard to do, I don't think. And we also need to look at the whole ecosystem services thing. Why is it that people own the land in Scotland, also in the sun and the water um, and the wind, which they don't do anything to create? Why don't we separate the ownership of the land from the ownership of the ecosystem services that go with those? So that you can actually provide people with affordable power from the wealth and natural resources that Scotland has. But at the moment, very little of the feed in Paris comes to people in low-income communities, whereas it goes on to the bills. And I think we need to look seriously at the whole notion of citizen income again. We need to revive that conversation about how citizen income would, would affect macroeconomy as well as provide social justice. And there's no reason why farmers couldn't be seen as GPs. You know, 1947, when we chose to have the 1947 Agriculture Act, which is about supporting productionism, we had the 1947 Health Act, which is about the National Health Service, which is about the 1947 Food Act, in which we could have stuffed the farmers' mouths with gold. We've been doing pretty successfully ever since. And we could say, okay, you produce food for people in Scotland, you do it in a way which doesn't stuff up the environment, you let people have access to your farm, you educate people, in return for that, you'll get a good income. Um, at the moment, we're not doing that. We're sort of, we're trying to, to um, either very blunt and sort of support the sort of farming we want. Yep, I think we're just about there. Oh, yeah, you and Stable Girls, people haven't seen them. 17 goals being agreed um, across a number of countries, across the whole um, of the world. And it's really important that up there, this issue about end hunger, achieve food skills, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture isn't a goal for Rwanda, and it isn't a goal for Belize, and it isn't a goal for Cambodia, it's a goal for everybody. And I think that should drive the Scottish Government's sustainable development policy. So having hunger up there at number two means we need to address hunger in Scotland, not just the very good work we do in Malawi. Okay, next one, I think, probably the last one. Yeah, and just very briefly, we do need to start measuring food insecurity because food banks are in the tip of the iceberg. Behind every food bank, there are people that are not eating well and are skipping meals. And the food insecurity experience scale that's been developed in the room is going to be a useful tool for that. It's not the only tool. But Gallup have just used this scale to ask the same eight questions to people in 140 countries. So in about April, we'll get the figures from Gallup, including the UK, although this day is not in Scotland, have been disaggregated, where we actually look not at did you go to food bank? But how were you affected by this thing about food insecurity? Starting about, are you worried that you're going to run out of food? And did you go without food for the whole day? And when we look at that, it's got, my guess is it would be somewhere between 10 and 20% will score quite highly on that food insecurity experience. Yeah. But it gives us a tool, particularly if we can build inside that Scottish Health Survey, 
and use it every year that allows us to actually monitor whether we're progressively realizing the right to do it. I think that's me. Thank you.